Welcome everyone. Uh, before I get going with my presentation, if you'll click on the view button in the upper right hand corner of your screen and select speaker view, you'll be able to see my entire PowerPoint presentation, my entire screen. Uh, we're going to ask that you stay muted during the presentation. You can ask questions in the chat. Uh, I'll have a couple of polls where I'll ask questions and you'll have the opportunity to answer, but if there are other times you have a specific question or if I ask a more general question and you want to answer in the chat, that's great. Uh, before we start talking about depth perception and illusions, let me tell you a little bit about myself and where I'm from. My name is Dr. Neil Bellovo. Uh, I am from IUPUI in the Department of Psychology. I'm also part of the neuroscience program. So I've been there for 28 years, I think. So a long time. Uh, I teach neuroscience courses now, predominantly also uh, drugs and behavior. I'm part of an addictions neuroscience group, so I teach courses that have to do with drug abuse and addiction. But before that, for years, I taught um, an introductory psychology course that had a focus on the biological side. So sensation and perception was part of uh, what I covered in that course. And depth perception and illusions is one of my favorite topics from from those years and so i thought this would be a fun time i also talk about depth perception and illusions in my introductory neuroscience course in fact that's going to be coming up this week uh, when i teach so All right, when you look at this picture, what do you see? Give you a couple moments to look at it. I think typically people will tell me, and I asked my daughter last night what she saw, and immediately it's a rider on a horse with another horse. But as you continue to look at the picture, I would imagine that you at least see a Native American face and another Native American face. So yeah, you're a lot of human faces. So here's one, here's one. There's actually seven of them, I think. So here's one. Here's one, here's part of one. There's one right here. Here's another one. Um, I think there's one down in here and I think there's one over here. And so we're all looking at the same picture. So we're all taking in the same visual information. It's how that information is being processed in the brain. What are we paying more attention to what is catching our attention first when we look at, at the figure. And so this is what's known as perception. So sensation is the detecting of the visual information from the environment. So when you look with your eyes, that information is coming in through, in through your eyes and being transferred up into the brain and then the brain has to make sense of that incoming information and organize and interpret that information and that's called perception and how we perceive things can differ drastically from individual to individual because it also along with the actual information coming in it also relies on your past experiences your knowledge and since each of us have different past experiences and different types of knowledge that we're familiar with, we're going to interpret 
the incoming information differently by our brains. So we're going to, and I'm putting it in quotations, we're going to see things differently, okay? Now we're looking at a flat picture because we're looking at a computer screen. But when you look at that picture, I think you would agree that the two horses look closer to you than, than some of the trees and the bushes and the rock formations where you can see the, the two really large Native American faces look closer to you than the, than the horses and there's a stream water running that appears closer. So even though we're looking at, even though we're looking at a flat picture, we're seeing things in three dimensions and that's depth perception. So your brain is using cues from that picture to try to judge distance. And if we can judge distance, we can see depth, okay. And so, as I just mentioned, our brain uses these depth perception cues to allow us to see in three dimensions. Our retina, the back of our eye, where our photoreceptors, our sensory receptors for vision are located, our retina is a two-dimensional surface. But yet we see in three dimensions. And we see in three dimensions because our brain takes cues from the environment and determines distance of objects. And if we can determine how far away something is or how far away a set of things are, then we can have depth perception. And one set of cues we use only requires one eye. And these are called monocular cues. And the monocular cues are also called pictorial cues because these are the types of cues that painters and um, other types of artists and photographers use in their pictures to make a picture look three-dimensional instead of flat. And so if we look at this famous painting, there are a number of monocular cues that the artist has used in order for us when we look at the painting to see depth rather than seeing a flat picture. So if you look at what I'm, you perceive as the very front of the picture, you'll see an umbrella being held by a, a man and just the very edge of his umbrella is overlapping the umbrella being held by the couple. And so our brain uses that information to make a determination because of overlap that the man must be closer to us than the couple. Now, if we look at the couple's faces, we can see detail. We can see their eyes, their nose, their mouth, um, ears. Whereas if we look at people that we perceive as being further away from us in the picture, you don't see that detail. And the painter does that on purpose. That's a cue that our brain uses to say, oh, those people are further away from us than that couple, even though we're looking at a flat painting. Okay, the angle of the buildings, uh, again, the detail. If you look at the cobblestone or street, if you look at the cobblestones that are supposed to be close to us, they're painted with a lot more detail, the lines between the stones than the cobblestones that are supposed to be further away from us. And so all of these are cues that painters use, but these are also cues that we use continually to make judgments about distance so that we can see in a three-dimensional world. Okay, so these are monocular cues, but we also have cues that involve both eyes. And cues that are, involve both eyes are called binocular cues. Okay, and binocular cues, the most reliable one is retinal disparity, which we're going to, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to demonstrate with you on the next slide. But usually binocular or 
binocular disparity or retinal disparity is your most reliable cue. Your brain uses information about the difference between the images coming in from your left and right eye, how much of a difference there is between those two to determine how far away the, image, the object is that you're looking at. Because the closer the object is to you, the bigger the difference between what the two eyes are seeing. The further away from you an object is, the more similar the image coming into the two eyes is. But the brain has to take those two images and merge them together because you're not walking around seeing a left eye view of the world and a right eye view of the world. You're seeing one view of the world. So let's see if we can trick your brain. All right, so this is the floating finger illusion or the little sausage illusion. And I can't see all of you, so I'm going to trust that you can do this. And if you look at the young boy, the young man in the, in the picture, he's taking his two fingers, his two index fingers, and putting them, not quite touching, I would start with them touching, put them right in front of your eyes, not touching your eyes, but in front of your eyes, and stare at them. And you may have to stare a little past them, so stare a little past your eyes at the computer screen. And then move your fingers away from each other just a bit. What are you seeing? Are any of you seeing a floating finger, like in the picture on the right? And you may have to play with it a little bit. If I put my two fingers right in front of my eyes, I can see the floating finger, and then I pull, pull my fingers apart a little, and then it's floating in between them. And then I can move my fingers away and you'll continue seeing it, you'll continue seeing it until you get to a point where your brain is able to merge. So great. So you are experiencing the floating finger illusion. So here your brain is tricked. There's not, you don't have an extra little floating finger, but the brain is trying to take the images from the two eyes and put them together. So this is a case where our most reliable depth perception cue is actually failing us. And so we have an illusion. So we're gonna spend the rest of our time going through illusions, talking about illusions, some different types of illusions, and how the brain is using information that typically is very reliable and allows us to uh, have a reasonable interpretation of the world, a consistent interpretation of the world and what's going on around us so we can survive and thrive in that world. But sometimes the brain makes a mistake. So an illusion is a misleading image. So these are visual illusions. They're different from hallucinations. A hallucination is when uh, there's actually no sensory information coming in. So for example, someone who has schizophrenia may have auditory hallucinations where they hear voices when voices don't really exist. Or somebody using a hallucinogenic drug like LSD might have visual hallucinations where they see things that aren't really there. But that's not an illusion. An illusion you're actually bringing in visual information, your brain is just interpreting it wrong. So based on other cues in the environment, based on your past experience, your expectations of how things should be, your brain is trying to make a reasonable interpretation of the incoming information and just makes a mistake. So that's an illusion. And these illusions often rely on depth perception cues. 
the brain's just using those depth perception cues inaccurately uh, because of other things happening. So we're gonna start with a simple illusion. It's a famous illusion that's been around for hundreds, over a hundred years, and that's the Mueller liar illusion. And it's very simple. Look at these two lines and tell me which one's longer. And I think I can. All right, so we have a couple votes for the top, a vote for the bottom. And let's see which one of you are right. Which ones of you? The two lines are the same length. And so your brain is tricked into believing that the one line is longer than the other because of other cues. So the arrowheads that on the top line often trick the brain into believing that that line is stretched longer. Uh, there are theories, there are actually quite a few theories about why the Mueller liar illusion occurs and, and there are theories, no one's agreed for sure what's happening. Uh, The other idea is that we live in a carpentered world and so we're used to angles going in certain directions in corners of rooms that are closer versus further away from us. Uh, like I say, there are several different theories and not really an agreed upon. All right, let's try a diff another this is a geometrical illusion because it involves lines and angles. Let's check another one out. This is the Pagendorf illusion. So if you look at these two lines, which line is continuous with the black line? Now, it's not fair if you take a piece of paper and hold it up on your computer screen and try to design. All right, so again, we have a split, so let's check and see what it actually is. It's the red line. And so when you look at it with the gray interrupting rectangle, it often, and actually most people believe it's the blue line, that's what they'll tell me. And when I look at it without thinking, <laughs> um, to me it looks like the blue line, but it's actually the red line. Okay. And so this disruption of linearity due to the, to the rectangle distorts the brain's ability to, to connect the to connect the lines. All right, let's see what illusion we have next. All right, so those were two examples of geometrical illusions. There are lots of different types of illusions. I'm just gonna go through them. If you have questions about them, I'll try to answer. Um, talk a little bit about them along the way. All right, so which center circle is bigger? And I don't have a polling question for this. I don't think I entered this one. Oh yeah, we did. I lied. I didn't mean to lie. All right, the answers came in. 
that it appears when you look at these that the circle on the left is larger because of the contrast between this circle and the smaller outer circles when in fact this circle and this circle are exactly the same size. But your brain is contrasting, comparing this set of circles to this one compared to this set of circles to this one and makes the assumption that this one must be larger when in actuality, as I mentioned, they are exactly the same size. Okay. All right. Count the black dots. So stare at the grid. You can stare at an individual circle or you can just sort of stare at the, the figure overall. If you look at an individual circle, it should appear white to you, but the circles around it should be flipping back and forth between, oh, all the dots are white. Yes, they're all white, but are, are they flipping? Is your brain seeing them as black and then seeing them flashing back and forth? Yes, I see yes. Uh, I tested these on my daughter last night, my college age daughter, and she's like, they're all white. And I'm like, do you see black? She's like, no. So I have no idea why she's not seeing this, this illusion, but it's again the brain it's the contrast between the black squares and the gray and the white dots and the black and white are opposing colors and the brain is trying to make sense of that incoming information uh, all right i'm gonna leave you for one sec only for one second because i'm here with my dog and she's crying to go out and you guys are going to hear her crying if i don't quickly, and it's very quickly let her out. She obviously is not impressed with illusions. All right, what do we have? Let's see what we've got next. All right. Are the horizontal lines parallel or do they slope? I'm showing you illusion. So at some point you're going to, I was going to say, at some point you're going to be figuring this out. Yes, they are all parallel. And in fact, if I could move this little black line, I'd have to unshare my screen. But if I could move this little black line to each one of these, I could prove to you that yes, indeed, every one of these lines is straight. But our eyes, sending this information to our brain, and it's, again, this is a perceptual problem, so this is a, a brain interpretation problem, because of the black and white contrast, is sloping those lines. And this actually has a practical application when bricklayers are laying brick to build walls, they have to be careful about the patterns they use and the colors they use because they can end up having bricks that are laid in a perfectly parallel fashion you know use a, a a level and make sure they're perfectly level but yet when people walk by and look at at it it'll look crooked and so they have to take that into account when they're laying their patterns out because a homeowner is not going to be happy if the bricklayer puts the brick on their house and people are walking by going, how much did you pay those people to put that brick on there? It looks horrible. So just something that has to be considered. All right. Now we're going to look at it, a color illusion. What's the difference when you look at the, the two 
paths of whatever that's supposed to be, where the arrows are pointing. The top one is darker. I see they're both the same color. Somebody already knows the illusion. Yes, they're the same color. Why does the top one appear darker to you? Does anyone know or have a guess? Because it, for most people it does, right, it's because of the light and dark. If you look at the background, exactly, the light background on top, your eyes, your eyes are taking in the information. It's exactly the same visual information, color information, but the brain is interpreting the shade based on the context, based on the environment. So the top half has a light background, the bottom half has a darker background. And so the brain takes that into account when it interprets the incoming information. And in this case, it made a mistake. It appears to be darker to us, to most of us, when in fact it's the same color. All right, well, now some reversible figures. Reversible figures, when you look at an object, your brain immediately, part of that object will jump out at you as the figure, and part of it will recede as the background. So if you look across your rooms, there are certain objects in your room that your brain is going to say, oh, those are the figures in the room and the walls are the background. But with reversible figures, your brain has a hard time deciding what's figure, what's background, and they flip back and forth, what you attend to, what you pay more attention to. And I've got, I saw both at the same time, both. Occasionally you'll get someone like, I don't see a duck or I don't see a rabbit. So, you know, for a duck, this would be the duck's bill. For the rabbit, these are the rabbit's ears and this would be the rabbit's nose. And, you know, both of those answers are correct. Seeing them both is correct. I've had people ask me, well, I can't see what's wrong with me. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just the way your brain is interpreting the information. So here's a couple other examples, church or chicken. And I'm sure when they built the church, they weren't planning for it to look like a chicken, but we have knowledge of what a chicken looks like with its beak and its eyes. So for most of us or many of us, we look at this and it's like, that looks like a chicken. And for other people, they might say to you, I don't see a chicken. I just see the church building. The bottom right figure, Native American or an Eskimo. This is one I had to point out to my daughter because she saw the Native American face right away. You know, nose, mouth, chin. But the Eskimo, she, until I said, sleeve, sleeve, hood of the parka, and then she's like, oh, okay. So again, a reversible figure in terms of what is your brain seeing as the actual figure, what's receding more into the background. A very, another one that's probably more famous, this one you see often, is this a picture of a beautiful young woman? How do you, okay. Hold that question for a second and I'll try to answer that. So the question that came up was, how do you explain those paintings, pictures, another hidden figure, most of the time three-dimensional, only when, I, when you cross your eyes. You've got to shift your focus from the 
overlying pattern. The hidden figure is, for most of us, recedes into the background. And so we have to force our eyes and then our brain to shift from what is the over, sort of the overlying figure to bring out the background and make the background pop out. And it's really, for me, it took me forever because your brain wants to immediately just see that overall pattern, but you're trying to pull the, the background figure, the hidden figure out, if that makes sense. All right, I think we're, oh yeah, we're, we're pretty much to the end, but here another, you know, here's the, the elderly lady, her eye, her mouth, her chin, her nose, but then the beautiful young lady, here's her chin, her nose, her eyes. Probably one of the most famous reversible figures is this one, all is vanity. And then just to finish up because I, at the end, so your brain usually works fine. It does a very good job of interpreting the world around you based on your knowledge, based on your past experience. You know how large a person is, what size a person is. So when you look off in the distance and you see a, a teeny tiny person that looks the size of an ant, you're not, not like, whoa, that's an ant way out there. You're like, no, that's a person very far away. That's knowledge and past experience. And we use all that to interpret the world, but sometimes our brains trick. So I don't have time for Charlie Chaplin. If you go to YouTube and type in Charlie Chaplin illusion, um, you can check it out, okay? So thank you everyone. If you have any last questions, I know it's past 3.30 and you may be wanting to go to a four o'clock presentation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm glad it was fun. Science should be fun. It is fun.